So the last video, uh, we did a quick overview of what the three laws of thermodynamics are and some basic understanding of what it all means. So we're going to look at the first law of thermodynamics kind of in depth. And if you remember, it's the law of conservation of energy. It's that the total energy of the universe, total, total energy, EI, so total energy is usually described by, as EI, uh, um, does not change. So the total energy of the universe does not change. And so what that, uh, so the total energy for any isolated system does not change. So in terms of uh, symbolic uh, language, total energy is, uh, so you have the energy of potential, you have potential energy, you have kinetic energy, and that basically sums up every type of energy, but uh, kinetic energy can be broken down into several things. Potential energy can be broken down into several things. So potential energy can be broken down into energy in a gravitational field. It can be broken down into energy in chemical bonds. Um, it can be the energy in a spring. So there's a lot of different types of, uh, and, um, and when I say a spring, I mean a spring that's been compressed or stretched and held in that position. So a lot of different types of potential energy. There's a lot of different types of kinetic energy. For example, uh, temperature, therm thermal energy is random kinetic energy of uh, basically of atomic particles such as uh, atoms and molecules. Um, there's there's work. So uh, we can we'll define what work is. There's other things like electrical energy. And so the total energy of a system is all of the potential energy and all of the kinetic energy that it contains. And so a lot of times the total energy is defined as internal energy. So internal energy, which E or EI, whichever you prefer, um, and and so, and sometimes in physics uh, and in chemistry, internal energy is, is uh, symbolized as E, and other times it's symbolized as U. And so, because the biochemistry textbook that I'm using uh, uses E, I'll continue to use that. However, realize that in a physics textbook, uh, the, the physics textbook I have, they all use U as internal energy. Now typically when you're dealing with energy, um, potential energy and kinetic energy are constantly one being converted into the other and back and forth. And so you may have, for example, um, a, a ball rolling and it hits into a spring and it binds up that spring. And so you're storing up potential energy in that and then that spring will convert back into kinetic energy and push that ball back in the other direction. So kinetic and potential energy are always constantly changing places with each other. However, um, the total energy is always conserved. It always stays the same. Now, so far, we've been talking about the energy of an isolated system. But what happens when your system isn't isolated? So I have, I have uh, basically this, uh, this system, and it's got a little leak right here. And energy can be exchanged, or somehow energy is able to be exchanged. For example, a, a good example is a piston. So in this, in this piston, I have this piston inside of here, and right in here, in, inside of this cavity, I have combustion going on. And so what happens is that combustion will create heat that will be transferred out, and it will also change the volume, so it will push, it'll push this piston up to a new position uh, right here. And so work is being, uh, is being transferred from inside to outside. So this is what's called a closed system. It's not isolated, uh, meaning the mass in here has no direct way of getting out unless, of course, uh, the engines are designed so that once the piston goes up, then back down, it pushes out the excess, uh, the burnt up gasoline or, or whatever the fuel is. But uh, theoretically, we'll just say that this is a closed system because mass can't get in or out, but energy can get transferred in or out. So in a closed system, or even in an open system, we've got to talk about the change of energy. And so the change of energy is always equal to 
the heat transferred into into the system plus the work done on the system and so there's in, in work we're going to talk about mechanical work so w mechanical and we're going to talk about w extra and so uh, the work the the total work is all of the mechanical and all extra work done and so extra work um, is talking about things like for example uh, the ele if an electrical current were running through the system that would be some kind of extra work but for most cases in engineering and in biochemistry this uh, this extra work doesn't play a role um, because it doesn't uh, it doesn't change or rather I should say I should say that no extra work is done on a system except for the mechanical work now, so what is work? Work, mechanical work specifically, is defined as as force applied. So the sum of all of the forces applied times the distance. So the change of x, or the change of dis. So x, I'm talking about the change of a position. So force times distance. And if you have competing forces, or if you have if you have two forces working together, if you have two forces working against each other, it's it's the sum of the forces times the change in position. So the sum of the forces times the distance. Now, in a system, when you're talking about a system, the the change in in internal energy what is never calculated by if if the whole system were picked up and moved somewhere that doesn't change the internal energy inside of the system so that's not the kind of work we're talking about so the type of work we're talking about on a system is typically defined as as uh the negative of the pressure times the change of volume so given our in our our piston up here again the pressure if there's a pressure applied to this or even if the pressure is constant as this moves up the volume changes so if the pressure could change and the volume so if this got stuck the pressure would increase but but the volume would stay the same or if if it's moving and lubricated well um, the pressure could increase the volume could increase the pressure could stay the same and the volume could increase and so all of those things are examples of work being done by the system on the environment so it's transferring energy from the system to the environment so there's a change of internal energy Another possibility is that the environment could apply a pressure down on this and add energy to the system by doing work on the system. Now notice there's a negative sign in here. And the reason for that is because we're talking about the internal energy of this piston. If it does work on the environment, if it transfers work to the environment, that would mean an increase of volume would, would mean we would lose internal energy. So we're going to subtract the work done on the environment. However, if the environment did work on the piston, we would actually add that to find our change of internal energy. Now, really quick, I know I said I would use what the textbook uses, so let me change that to delta E. And in summary, what we've come to so far is that we've said uh, the first law of thermodynamics requires that no energy can be created or destroyed. So if the internal energy of something changes, that means it has to have went somewhere or come from somewhere. And that somewhere is heat that has been added or taken away or work that has been done on or done by the system. Now we said that the the change of internal energy is equal to the heat transferred uh, plus the work done on the environment, so minus P times delta V. Now let's imagine that the volume does not change. So the volume does not change. So if we say that the internal energy is equal to Q plus W and W equals negative P delta V, well, if the volume doesn't change, that means the change of volume equals zero, and so this whole term cancels out. And so in an isovolumetric situation, the change of energy is equal to the heat transferred. However, constant volume, so this is, this is constant volume, isovolumetric, 
so a constant volume. However, in biochemical uh, processes, constant volume is very unlikely. However, constant pressure is extremely likely. So what thermodynamicists, people that study thermodynamics, what they've done is they've defined a state function called enthalpy. So uh, H, we're going to define H as enthalpy. And then we're going to try to explain what enthalpy is. First, let me say what I mean by that it's a state function. So a state function means that the only thing that matters is the initial state and the final state. So how you get from point A, the initial state, to the final state does not matter. It does not matter what path you take. Whatever the initial and the final state are is all that matters. There's a lot of state functions. For example, we're going to talk about free energy. So free energy is a state function. Um, and you don't have to put delta on there, but G is a state function. And uh, H is a state function. And so what the, the point is, it doesn't matter how you get from beginning to end on a state function. What matters is what the beginning and what the end is. So what is enthalpy? Enthalpy is defined as the total energy or the internal energy plus uh, work done on the system. So plus the pressure times the volume. Now if, uh, so if we want to know what the change of enthalpy is, so change of enthalpy, uh, this is a, may not be intuitively um, breathtaking at first, but uh, if we have the change of enthalpy, so the total energy is, is Q minus PV. So we'll say, we'll, we'll actually scratch that out, Q minus P delta V, because we're talking about the change of enthalpy. And then we add PV, P delta V. So if the pressure is constant, this equation works. Uh, it works when the pressure is constant. So we can actually cancel out PV. And so delta H is equal to the heat transferred at constant pressure. Heat transfer at constant pressure pressure. And we'll just put pi for pressure. And so I'd like to note really quick, uh, it's not pointed out in the textbook, but if both pressure and volume are constant, then enthalpy equals the t internal energy. Now the last thing I want to say about enthalpy is uh, that some, in order to compare the enthalpy of, of various reactions, a standard state has, is defined. So enthalpy, so delta H, uh, delta H uh, naught, with not meaning the little zero up here. Um, so delta H naught is the same thing as saying delta H standard state. And there's actually a standard state. Uh, so delta G, whenever we get there, has a standard state. Uh, delta E has a standard state. And so what standard state is, is, is what would the change in enthalpy be if this was done under a set standard of conditions? So for example, um, one, of the con one of the conditions that you might have in a reaction is the concentration of solutes. So the standard state for uh, enthalpy is at one molar concentration of solutes. And so uh, whenever you're trying to figure out what the standard state is, for the most part, um, you can just look it up on a chart. But if you have to determine it experimentally, the, the change in enthalpy for standard state is, is going, to, it's going to be defined as what the effect of the temperature is on the equilibrium constant. So it's defined as negative R, which is the gas law constant, times the change of the natural log of Keq divided by the change of 1 over the temperature. Now because the gas law constant is in Kelvin, uh, your temperature has to be in Kelvin as well. And now this can actually be determined from the slope of a Van Hoff plot. And so uh, by Van Hoff plot, so it, 
if you if that name's ringing a bell, it's probably because you took a chemistry class where you talked about the Van Hoff factor that has to do with colligative properties. A Van Hoff plot has nothing to do that I know of. It has nothing to do with colligative properties. And so if you're talking about the um for example, Van Hoff uh Van Hoff factor would would say that the osmotic pressure um or let's just say, yeah, let's just say that the, yeah, the osmotic pressure is proportional to, so proportional is this funky thing right here, I can't ever draw it, is proportional to um, the, the dissociation, so let's say if I had Na, uh, NaCl, is proportional to the dissociation of those two, so the Van Hoff factor would be 2. Uh, so you, instead of doing one mole, if I had one mole of NaCl uh, using it for my colligative property, I would end up using two times that one mole because this disassociates into two. Now, that's Van Hoff factor. That is not what I mean by a Van Hoff plot. So what I mean is if we were to graph, if we were to graph the uh, R times the natural log of KEQ, whatever that is, at a given temperature. So let's say that this is 1,000 over over the temperature, and that's in Kelvin to the negative one. So um, basically, and I put 1,000 because it's uh, it gives you small numbers. You could do one over T, but you would have really large numbers to deal with, and that's fine if you want a really large graph. But you'll get that the, the equilibrium constant changes as the temperature changes, and so you get a, a, a graph. And so if this graph is curved, I find the, uh, I find the, the, the tangent line uh, where I'm looking at, so the tangent line here, whatever that slope is of that tangent line, is going to give me the delta H uh, standard state at whatever temperature I'm looking at. And so a plot of the, the e equilibrium constant versus temperature, if you do the natural log times R versus temperature, this is called a Van Hoff plot. And it's used, to, uh, it's used in thermodynamics. And the main purpose of it is to find the standard state of enthalpy.